the introduction of the record, the idea was to try and build up as much noise possible before the opening track. And like when I'm listening to it now, it sounds like a jet engine taking off with like all these like noises going off, and it's very synthy. And it kind of like reminds me of the Tron soundtrack, but it's mainly just guitars. It's like Ross would just go on autopilot when we were recording that, and he picked up a guitar, tuned all the strings to the same note, uh, which is called ostrich tuning, I think, and then and then he just took it into the studio and recorded a feedback sound of all the strings just resonating off one another. And then I was like adamant that there should be this like thumping club bass drum thing to kind of like go into Running Wild, which didn't make the final cut, but you know, in my head, that's like what's going on there. song since the first record came out in fact well before the first record came out and it's just such a live staple of our set list that it would have just been weird to have it as anything but the album opener. It's a nice kind of sigue between the first record and the second record and it's kind of like our attempt to kind of make a jokey psychedelic pop record and like the main kind of theme of it is based off the countdown theme tune almost so um I don't know. It's it's just it's just like a really cheesy mishmash of a game show and um, a psychedelic pop record. Lyrically, it's not being like particularly modern because it's just referencing old England by way of Sherwood Forest and Beachy Head and the Great Fire of London. And it's just kind of I don't know. It's not got a whole lot to say this track, but it's always been like loads of fun to play and really proud of it. Um, Never Awake is the second song on the record and we'd originally recorded it at like a slightly slower tempo which made the drum sound a bit more baggy and the riff was just a bit more like heavy for being slow, it was a lot more stonerish than it is now and then like we got to the chorus and I started singing and it just sounded like I was yawning, it was just like all the gaps in between the songs were just uh, like it, it just it just went on too long. So uh, to, so to kind of like combat that, we like went and re-recorded it again about three BPM faster, and it just kind of tightened it up and made it sound a lot more menacing and a bit more like I don't know, interesting really. And the song is kind of like all the songs on the record seem to have a different setting or a different location, and um, they're kind of places that we drive past or go to like when we were growing up. And this is set on Ringing Low Moor, which is like a recurring location throughout the record, because like it would be where we drive uh, over from where we were living to go into Sheffield to go and see gigs and stuff. And like we spent a lot of time in other people's cars, listening to and like sharing music and talking about music and stuff. So it's kind of like um, I don't know whenever whenever we drive over there, it's kind of a very bleak, barren, savannah-esque landscape. Always kind of I don't know makes you think about bigger things in the world. So like it's um, a key location on the record and it kind of like crops up again in the woods and also the song, uh, the, the closer, Have You Forgotten My Name. What we want is a song about it's it's almost like a getaway film. I got like really obsessed with these getaway films where a couple just like go on like a murderous rampage or they'll um, just go and cause like a load of havoc. So in in the film, the most like obvious lyrical thing there is like related to Bonnie and Clyde, but I don't know, uh, it's more kind of like films like Gun Crazy and there's like a French film called Piero Le Fou, which is really interesting, really exciting and really weird as well. And, and it's just like the tracks kind of like trying to get to like the energy and excitement of like 
when you fall in love with someone and it feels like a completely natural thing to like go on a bank robbing spree or a mass murder or to like implicate the local police force in uh, you know bribery and stuff like that and um, I think we were just messing around when we wrote this one and because of that it's probably like one of the like most easygoing songs on the record until I realised that it was probably just a bit too poppy so the kind of like narrator of the track has a bit of a mental breakdown when he realises that the freedoms of like being able to do whatever they want to do doesn't really benefit anyone apart from himself and by thinking that he can like be meaningful or whatever it all collapses and um, it's, it, it becomes restricting on itself so like I don't know the freedom is suddenly becomes like a, a, a bit of a restriction on them and no one tells us we're wrong and no one tells us when to stop and no one takes account and no one steps in or has the guts to call us up I don't know where I like to go Like with Running Wild, we wrote Favourite Son uh, before the before the first record came out, so both this and Running Wild seem like incredibly old songs for us, and we've been playing this live for, for quite a while, so it felt, it felt like the right thing to do to keep it on the record. And yeah, it was, it was going to be a, a B-side or something, but I don't know, it never, it never got recorded in the right way, and I don't know, it, we didn't, it didn't feel like it was worth being on the same kind of single as another song that we put out or whatever, so it just felt better to save it for the record. Originally the song like comes to that halt and that's where like the song just stopped and it just sounded like a bit of a kind of like wind down so we just lumped that extra verse and chorus on the end. And it's not, it, for me it isn't like the best track on the on the record by a long way, I think it's kind of one of the more easy going things but I really like the lyric, I want it to be yours and I want yours to be mine because it's just really funny for me and, and um, just like complete ownership seemed like a really funny thing to talk about. And on the last record I was messing around with kind of terms of endearment and the subject of love and on this album I was trying to ma move away from like the wider concept of that and focus on how it impacts on relationships and what those feelings can bring out on people. So Favourite Son kind of displays the most distorted of these relationships where the narrator is seeking a relationship based out of favouritism, um, which, you know, well, I find it funny. This song came together worryingly quickly and it's the quickest we've ever written anything. We were just in our room uh, in Sheffield and just like playing around with a bunch of stuff and the verse and the bridge kind of like came together incredibly quickly and we've always as a band, I don't know, well up until like a certain point had a bit of a no chorus policy. I just felt like they were really cheesy but um, like on the last record with Fuck About I was like I oh, will just stick a chorus in here, and I could feel this this chorus coming through. So I asked Rory to like stop playing the drums for five minutes, and kind of like went through all the like little note changes in the chorus. And within five minutes, the chorus was done. We had like this tune that was suddenly there, and the lyrics suddenly came in. And yeah, it was um, it was a rewarding writing experience. And the, the middle eight section, um, the location. For that kind of bit is set in in a lagoon uh, but specifically the lagoon from the 1989 bbc adaptation of c.s lewis's uh, voyage of the dawn treader where eustace turns into a dragon and like we used to watch that all the time when we were kids we had like a vhs of it and we'd always put it on and i was like i was researching for this and i was going on youtube and i found the entire series is on youtube and um i was watching it i was just I was just appalled, it looked just, it was so dated and it felt so out of touch of like what it instilled as me as in what it instilled in me as a kid, which was just absolute 
fear and excitement. Just it just looked really naff. So um, yeah, you should go and check that out. One day we came into the studio and Ross kept telling us about this new Arabic cafe that he'd just been to on the wicket. And he'd had a shish kebab there and he said that he'd had a naan as big as a table. And, um, and the wicker is uh, like a street in Sheffield which is just full of kebab shops. And there's a sci-fi shop there and there's this really scary pub called The Big Gun that I'm never going to go into but they've got karaoke on Tuesdays there. And so the next day me and Rory went to this place and I had an egg and bean and tomato stew, and it was, and it was really good. And uh, the restaurant's called the Affer, and yeah, one of my favourite places to go for a bite to eat in Sheffield. And the Affer is like an honour code of the uh, Bedouin, which states that anyone, even an enemy, must be kept fed and given somewhere to stay if they need it. So we kind of went into the studio, and we had like positive uh, mental attitude to life, and we've feeling really full because they gave us way too much food and so like the apple was the working title for the song but you know um, we uh, we changed it to side by side at the last minute um, and the song is like a sort of sequel to we can do what we want where the runaway couple have begun to like tire of each other and all the excitement and energy is depleted and nothing's really gonna help them out or cheer them up and in the end and to their relief, they run away to the forest and make a bid to spend one final night together and when they wake up in the morning, without saying a word, they'll go separate ways. So it's kind of like a, I don't know, I, like throughout the record there's this sort of story that's been hinted at but it's not, it's not a concrete story but yeah. I went for a walk with my dad along the Snake Pass, which is uh, a road that runs quite near our house. We went up onto Bleaklow Moor, and Bleaklow is famous for having a couple of plane wreckages from the Second World War, where planes would pass too low over the moor in the fog and crash. And it's a really hot day at the beginning of October, and at the end of the walk, we went through this small wood next to a stream that brought us out while we parked the car. I don't really know what went on, but the trees were releasing a lot of spores at that time, and I must have breathed too many in. So it's really raspy for about three months after that, and I decided to go to the doctors and get it checked out, but they couldn't, they couldn't find anything. So this song's kind of like based on that walk and, and this really kind of weird thing that was going on in my chest where I couldn't breathe in properly. So that's kind of like the, the beginning point of the song. Rory really likes to refer to the guitar solo in this song as the Fleetwood Mac bit of the record, uh, which, like, I don't know, make of that as you will. And I really like how light and simple the track starts off. It's kind of one of the most easygoing intros to a song that we've we've done. Um, and then at the end, it just sounds really evil, just like all the guitar chords and everything just sound incredibly heavy. And, and it, it's... Um, it doesn't ever seem like it's going to go that way, but yeah, typically we play too many guitars and the drums just sound massive and the song just ends on this huge, distorted wall of noise. I tried to fit in a bit of a breather on this record at this point and it was always my intention to include an instrumental track 
We spent ages trying to figure this one out, just sat around in our practice room. It runs at a really odd time and it's hypnotic and, and while we were playing it, it's really easy to lose concentration and go into bits that you weren't supposed to. So it, it relied on me and Rory and Rob, who, who helped write this track, just all kind of being in the same room and maintaining eye contact and just being like, it's gonna change here. And um, and when we recorded it, it sounded mean and tight, but it didn't really fit in with any of the other tracks on the record. And Ross kind of suggested that I should pick up a guitar and just make as much noise and weird sounds from this guitar as possible. So we had a delay and a fuzz pedal, and I was just sat with the guitar on my lap, just hitting it and slamming it and pushing it around, playing bits of the guitar that you're not supposed to, and behind the neck and behind the nut and stuff, and and um, and pulling the strings off the fretboard and just hitting it, and it made all these really great sounds. And uh, I, I did that for about six minutes, and then we split it down the middle and put put it in one uh, put one left and put one right and then we were just left with this crazy noise over the top which sounded great but it didn't really kind of like it didn't have much purpose or orchestration or something so we kind of like analyzed each little bit and kind of took all these noises apart and recreated them and kind of orchestrated it so as the track goes on it becomes noisier and messier and then um, and so like one of my favourite noises comes about halfway through the second kind of verse progression where it sounds like there's this chain being smashed on the floor where it's just the sound of like what you get when you play the guitar behind the bridge and um, yeah, really proud of that guitar sound. Standing in the Cold is the big ballad of the record and um, it's about a mistrust of relationships and about being led on and it all ends incredibly dramatically with this car being set on fire. And most of our artwork and videos seem to stem around cars. And I don't I've no idea why I'm not a petrol head, I don't like I don't I'm not that interested in cars, but I seem to like really like them when it comes to imagery and writing songs and stuff so it's kind of picking up on that we'd come off a really heavy bout of touring and got into the studio and um, and so if my voice sounds a little husky on this track it's because I was absolutely knackered and every time I suggested um, to go and record it again I could just I, Ross would just look at me and go no 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 it sounds really good it sounds like you mean it but I sound absolutely knackered on it We tried a version of this in the summer and it was really exciting and we stripped apart Rory's drum kit and recorded it with the left hand side of the kit and the right hand side of the kit which kind of got rid of what Rory's drum style sounds like and um, it sounded a lot more unusual and, and it wasn't as fluid as Rory's style of playing um, but when we went to re-record it again we just took it live because it suited the sounds that we'd, we'd um, kind of built up by then and the, the track is separated into two parts. There's a really noticeable change in drum sound when the track kind of moves into the instrumental bit and there's kind of like a, a change in momentum. It's worth, worth listening out for anyway. And uh, the plinky sound that's running throughout the track is kind of the same noise that I was getting on undertow when I was just playing behind the neck. And, and it's really discordant. But I found that if I was playing chords on the fretboard, there was some sort of feedback going on. All the strings would resonate nicely into different chords. So that's kind of like how the, the chord structure was built up in the verses. And I was thinking that it was the album closer, but when we went for the first vocal take, I could just see that it wasn't working. And like my voice was just sounding a bit monotonous. 
I was getting really stressed out that the record would end on this really kind of dull note. I just kept listening to these vocal takes of myself and it, and it just sounded really, really depressing and boring. And then I kind of picked out this nice harmony that went over the top of it and, uh, and just like asked Ross to like stop what he's doing and like had to like run into the studio and record it before I forgot about it. I don't know, it's unusual when you're recording and you come across these floops and they're really good and they really kind of help the energy of the session. But we were always like aware that we were kind of self-parodying ourselves. So whenever we came up with something that we sounded cool, there'd be like a lot of like over extravagant high fives and like whooping and stuff. And at the end of the song, we're recording through this um, tape delay and this reverb. And the, the final sound of the record is just this kind of tailing off and Ross just turned off the tape delay on this chord and that's just what you hear at the end. It's just like this nice big final sigh to finish the record off.